Commissary, and we welcome those of you that are on Facebook. We are in Revelation chapter 20, the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. We'll get into that here in a moment. Uh, after our class is over, we'll have announcements. At that time, uh, we'll mention uh, those on the prayer list, at least some of them. I want to mention some now. Uh, remember Alex Thomason, that's Willa Dean's uh, granddaughter. Also Jodine Ellis, who's in AMMC. And uh, she now has COVID as well as Mike. And uh, Rudy, uh, Rudy also has uh, uh, COVID. So remember all of them. Remember Lauren uh, Snavely, uh, Greg and Laura uh, King's daughter. Remember Bill Rawls, uh, he's uh, home now, but uh, going to see a heart specialist sometime uh, soon. And uh, pray for uh, Ken and Naomi Burrell, uh, Daniel Lindsay, uh, the King family. Uh, please continue to remember Thomas and uh, uh, Pat uh, and the loss of their daughter, Renee Wallace. And there'll be a memorial service of some kind uh, here on March the 16th. So remember them. Also remember uh, our gospel meeting. It'll be March 10th through the 13th. And uh, Chase Allman of the Grace Point uh, Church of Christ in Jonesboro will be our speaker. We do have some advertisements on the table out in the foyer. Uh, you can uh, pick some up and... and uh, give those out. Uh, also, there will be a mail out uh, about the gospel meeting soon. That be tomorrow, be tomorrow and next Thursday. Okay, be, go, go out twice and, and a good portion of our, our county will, will see that. So be sure to uh, keep that in mind, be praying for, for uh, our meeting then, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, bow and begin then with the word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the many ways that you continue to bless our lives. We're grateful for the country in which we live and the many freedoms and opportunities that we enjoy. We're thankful for physical blessings, but most of all, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that are available to us through your son, Jesus. We're grateful for him and for his perfect life and his sacrificial death on our behalf. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit that dwells in us for uh, your church and the opportunity we have to be a part of your family. We're grateful for the Bible that tells us how to be saved, and how to live the Christian life. We pray for these that we've mentioned tonight, that you'll be with them in a very special way, especially be with those that are sick and uh, be with their caregivers, be with their families, and we pray that you'll give them what they most need at this time. Please bless us tonight as we study from your word. Help us always be willing to take what we learn and make application in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation was written to the seven churches of Asia, which were located in what is now Turkey. And uh, it's a book of hope. Sometimes we look at Revelation and say, it's a confusing book. It's a, a book that uh, is... Uh, just uh, kind of scary, but uh, the Lord was uh, trying to give these congregations here hope. And uh, a key verse in Revelation is Revelation 2, verse 10, where uh, John uh, said, uh, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. And uh, so the idea is you stay on the Lord's side, even if it costs you your life. And in the end, you'll be on the winning side. And so it's going to happen to Rome. Rome is the enemy of those seven churches. And they had experienced uh, persecution and would experience more persecution. Rome was a culprit. Uh, it was uh, an instrument of Satan against, uh, against the Christians of the first century. And chapter 18 announces the fall of Rome. Uh, figurative language is used. The word Rome is not used. The word Babylon is used. And Babylon was once a world power, 
had fallen, and uh, he calls Rome here Babylon. And then in chapter 19, you have a rejoicing over the victory that God has over the, uh, over, uh, the forces of Satan. Want us to look at chapter 20, one of the most uh, perhaps confusing chapters in the book of Revelation and indeed in the entire Bible. And uh, I am probably not going to uh, explain this in, in a way that uh, would satisfy everyone, uh, but let's go ahead and, and, and look at it. Beginning at verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Uh, a key and a chain uh, would signify power and control. And uh, these are not literal. He's going to bind Satan with the chain. Satan is a spiritual being, and you're not going to uh, chain a spiritual being with uh, a literal chain. So figurative language is used here. And we get to verse 2, we'll read about the thousand years. And the thousand years are also uh, symbolic, uh, not a literal thousand years. We'll get to that in a moment. The word abyss is used here in the New American Standard Bible. Uh, the King James, the New King James, and our New Living Translation all uh, use uh, the words bottomless pit. And this is, not, uh, this is not speaking about eternal hell. You read about that down in verse 10. Uh, this uh, is a dwelling place of Satan, the beast. And we find that out way back in chapter uh, 11. Uh, verse 2, And he laid hold of the dragon. Now, the devil is going to be called by four different names here. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years years. Now, to bind the devil means to uh, limit him. He's bound. He doesn't have the power that he uh, used to have. Uh, some uh, people, even uh, scholars in, in our uh, brotherhood, have thought that this binding was going to take place sometime in, in the future, beyond uh, the time that John was writing to these seven churches of Asia. Uh, I, don't, I don't take that uh, viewpoint. Um, some people uh, get the idea that uh, the binding uh, was going to happen whenever, uh, whenever the persecution would not be as severe. Uh, maybe even when the persecution would stop, showing that the Lord had power over, over Satan. And uh, some, some people, even conservative scholars, point to the time of Constantine. Constantine uh, was an emperor of Rome who embraced uh, Christianity. But uh, Constantine ruled uh, way up in the fourth century, early part of the fourth century. I don't know that that would give very much hope to the seven churches who are living 200 years before that. Uh, now, when then was Satan bound? I think there are several ingredients that uh, limited Satan. One would be the birth of Jesus Christ. Last thing that Satan wanted to see occur. Uh, and when uh, he was born, he did everything he could to defeat uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, you know, you, you get figurative language in chapter 12, chasing him all the way up to heaven and, and then when, he, when he, he couldn't get to him, Jesus had ascended in heaven. He had lived his life. He had died. Uh, and, and so he decided that he would, he would uh, persecute church instead. And that's what's happening now with the seven churches of Asia. But uh, uh, a certain limiting, a uh, certain binding of Satan happened when Jesus was born. A certain limiting or binding of Satan happened when, when he went through the temptations. You remember he'd been in wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and then Satan came and tempted him. You read it in one place in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, but he couldn't get Jesus to sin. 
He, he couldn't defeat him. Uh, and uh, then uh, you remember that uh, in, in the New Testament, we read of demon possession. Uh, seemed to be very common. And Satan had the power to enter a man's body and make him do things that he would not normally do, completely take control of him, control of his speech, control of his bodily uh, uh, movements, and, and so forth. That has all gone away because Satan has, has, been, has been bound. He's been limited somewhat. Uh, and certainly he was bound even when Jesus died. Now, it's one thing for Jesus to die. There's a lot of, you know, <laughs> men die. Jesus didn't stay dead. He was resurrected. And when he was resurrected, that really bound Satan, that really limited him. I want to go back to Genesis 3, verse 15. This is uh, whenever you have the uh, story of Adam and Eve, when they, when they sinned and, and, and God spoke to Adam and Eve, and then he spoke to the serpent. Genesis 3.15, And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the heel, or he shall bruise you on the head, excuse me, and you shall bruise him uh, on the heel. Genesis 3.15. It is believed by many conservative scholars here that this is a prophecy of Jesus and a prophecy of, of what was going to happen. He was going to deal, Satan would bruise him on the heel. It happened whenever Jesus was crucified on the cross. And maybe Satan thought, boy, I've, I've got him now. But that, uh, the, the injury on the heel is, is a minor, it's a minor injury. But he says, but the seed of woman, and the seed of woman according to Galatians 3.16 is Jesus. The seed of woman will bruise you on the head. An injury to the head is a death blow. And so Satan was really bound, I think, by these, uh, by these events, by the birth uh, of Jesus, by the temptations of Jesus, the casting out of demons, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Genesis 3.15 is nowhere quoted in the New Testament. Uh, there is a, a verse in Romans 16 that comes close but uh, I still think that this is a, a prophecy of Jesus. Now, he's going to be bound for a thousand years. This resem resembles or, or represents a, a time of completeness. The number 10 was a complete number. And the number 10 times itself is the, an even more complete number. And, and 10 times 10 times 10 is the even more complete, uh, em emphasizing a complete binding, complete limiting of, of, of Satan. Uh, 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. And a figurative language again to show that Satan uh, is, is completely uh, bound uh, and, and that he uh, is completely limited in, in what, what uh, he can do. Now, uh, I said a moment ago that some people believe that uh, this uh, binding was going to happen at some time in, you know, in the future. And that some people have pointed to Constantine, who ruled from 306 to, to 337 AD, long after this period of time. Quite a few scholars that point to that. Uh, well, uh, there, there's another Roman emperor who ruled from uh, 117 to 138 B or AD, uh, and uh, his his name was Hadrian, and and, and during the reign of Hadrian, uh, persecution was was relaxed. They didn't persecute churches much during <coughs> during his reign, uh, and I don't know why scholars and 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 none I haven't found a single scholar that pointed to Hadrian as maybe being the time when 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 the when the uh, persecution be relaxed representing uh, the the binding of Satan but truth is I don't think he's talking about the time of Constantine I don't think he's talking about the time of Hadrian uh, uh, I believe that uh, he he's speaking of the fact that Jesus has already been bound not Jesus, I'm sorry, that Satan has already been bound uh, by uh, what, what we've said 
uh, in you know his birth uh, through his uh, resurrection. Uh, let's go on to verse three uh, to, to add to this a little bit. And he threw him into the abyss or the bottomless pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Uh, now, in the abyss, in the bottomless pit, his power was limited. This doesn't mean that he was powerless. He was bound, but it doesn't mean that he could not still uh, inflict punishment upon the human race. Uh, I was watching the news uh, the other night and uh, they talked about a man that had escaped from the authorities. And, and, and they had a video of him running down the street escaping. And he was handcuffed, his hands were behind his back. He was bound, he was limited, and yet he was still able to run away and escape. Satan is bound, he's limited, but he still has power. And, and the Bible says he's like a roaring lion and he goes about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. And even though he has been bound, even though he has been limited, and even though he doesn't have the power that he once had, he still is, is able to inflict uh, temptation. Uh, and we, we all know that, all of us do. He's able to, he's able to uh, do, do his thing. Uh, now, uh, this binding is not something that was going to happen in the future, in my, my opinion. wasn't something that was going to happen in the, in the future of the seven churches of Asia. It was a binding that had already occurred. Now, in, in, in their day and time, the enemy was Rome. The culprit was Rome. Uh, R Rome was an instrument of Satan that was, was, was uh, you know, wreaking havoc upon, upon the early church. But the message is for all of us. It's, it's for every single age. We don't have Rome now, but you still have world powers. Uh, and, and, and some of these world powers are, are uh, persecuting powers that uh, take away uh, the uh, rights of Christians, might even persecute uh, Christians. The message is for us. Satan has been bound. He's been, he's been limited. Uh, and, but, the, but the message is, and he, he'd been limited, you know, the, uh, completely. That's where the thousand years come in. Not a literal thousand years. He's been limited completely, but he will lose. Uh, and we will win. And, and see, that was a message. That was a message to the seven churches. And again, if, if this was something that was going to happen sometime in the future, I'm not sure that they would have been comforted by it. But if it was something that the, the, the binding had already taken place and, and ultimately the victory was going to be on the side of God, good over evil, uh, the forces of heaven over the forces of hell, then that, that could bring comfort to them uh, then in their situation and it can bring comfort to you and me uh, here in, in the 21st century. Uh, Okay, let's look at, then uh, at, at, at verse 3. I don't think we read it, did we? Uh, and he threw him in the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nation any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a, a short time. Uh, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not to worship the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They completely reigned with Christ. He mentions two groups here. Those that had been martyred for the cause of Christ and those who have been faithful. They were reigning with Christ, uh, and, and they reigned completely, uh, completely with him. Uh, and then uh, in verse, uh, verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years completed. This is the first resurrection. If you read the premillennial stuff, they'll talk about two resurrections. 
this first one is not really a, a resurrection from the dead. These are the ones that have been faithful to God. Yes, they are dead, but they are reigning with Christ. Uh, and then he said the rest. Now, there, there's disagreements over who the rest of these are. I believe those who have not obeyed God, those who have not been obedient to God. Uh, and he's probably talking here about the end of time. He said, uh, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. And then in verse 6 he said, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. The first resurrection. Blessed are those who... who uh, have uh, been a part of the first resurrection. I believe that the first resurrection is when we become Christians. When, when we obey the gospel. When we're buried in the Lord, uh, with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. And we rise up for resurrected to walk in newness of life. I believe that's the first resurrection. And he's speaking of that group there. They, they are the blessed. The others... The rest of them who've not uh, experienced that first resurrection, we're all going to be resurrected. And we're all going to be resurrected at the same time, the, the general resurrection at the end of time. In John 5, 28 and, and, and 29, you, know, you find Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which they that are, that are in the grave shall come forth from the grave. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. All will be resurrected at the same time. There's not going to be two separate resurrections, one for the good, one for the bad. When he speaks about that first resurrection, he's speaking about us reigning with God, reigning with God. Uh, and he may be referring to us being in paradise, you know. And we, and we don't have time to go in to answer the question, where are the dead? You know, I, I believe that there's a waiting place for the dead uh, called Hades. And we'll all go to Hades, but Hades is divided in two parts. You have paradise, and then you have Tartarus. The paradise for those that are righteous, Tartarus for those that are unrighteous. We'll reign, we'll reign. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's what he's talking about. Uh, now... Um, Look, looking then, if you will, at, uh, let, me, let me get my notes straight here. You've heard this before, probably. Uh, Joe Jones has it in his book, and I've seen it in some other ones. Those, those who are born once will die twice. He mentions the second death here. Uh, if you, if, you know, uh, those who are born once will die twice. Those who are born twice and remain faithful would die only once. If, we're, if we are born twice, we're born physically and then born again and by the water and the spirit, that uh, we will, you know, we're born twice, we'll only die once. But if we're, you know, if, if we are uh, born once, you know, born physically, but we're never born again, then we're going to die twice. There'll be the physical death, and then there'll be the eternal death uh, in, in the lake of fire. Uh, let me read you what David Roper says in his, his commentary about this. And, and, and this might make, make sense to you. The thousand years is a time when Satan is bound and the Christian dead are alive and reigning, which is right now. The thousand years is a time when Satan is bound and the Christian dead are alive and reigning, which is right now. The statement about the thousand years being completed must therefore refer to the end of this age when Christ will return the dead will be raised and everyone will be judged. And, and so uh, the, the, the thousand years, again, uh, uh, figurative language, is uh, uh, referring to this age. And at the end of this age, Christ will return. You'll have the judgment 
that you'll have the dead being raised and, uh, and then e eternity. Um, let's look at verse, uh, uh, let's look at verses, uh, verse seven. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his uh, prison. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you know, your, your premillennial said, well, he'll be released and there'll be a great war, physical war here on, on the earth. And again, we listed things that aren't even mentioned in Revelation 20 that are mentioned in all the premillennial beliefs. Joe Jones has this illustration in, in his book. He says, suppose you have a dog that's chained uh, and he's chained to a wire. Uh, and, and he's able to run back and forth, you know, probably 40 or 50 feet. And, and he can't get to you uh, to bite you or harm you because he's chained to that wire. Unless you come within that 40 or 50 feet. And then, then he can harm you. Uh, our neighbors have, have a dog that's on the chain right now. And I don't think he'd bite you for anything. The reason he's on a chain hooked to a wire is he kept jumping the fence and running around the neighborhood. Uh, he's St. Bernard. <laughs> and he's the friendliest dog you'd ever want to see, you know. But just suppose he was a mean dog and he, and he, was, and he was chained to this wire. Uh, and, and you got within his, you know, within his reach. He could still, he could still uh, bite you. He could still harm you. Satan is chained. He doesn't have the power that he once had. He could enter people's bodies, you know. Uh, he, you know, demon possession through demon possession. He doesn't have that power anymore. But you come within his range, even though he's bound. Uh, you come within that 40 feet and he can do plenty of harm. And that's our problem, you know. Too many of us walk just as close to the brink of hell as we possibly can, and Satan has power there. James says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Our problem is so often we don't resist, resist him because he still has plenty of power, even though he's been bound, even though he's been limited, he still uh, is able to, to, to do harm. Uh, verse 8 here, uh, really quickly, about to run out of time here. Uh, and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So uh, Gog in the Old Testament is said to be from a place called Magog probably figurative language even in, in the Old Testament. It symbolized the evil of the Lord's people. You read Ezekiel 38, and it symbolizes here the enemy of God's people. And it seems like when you read verse 9 that Satan is, is, is going to be victorious and he's going to win the battle, but not so. Look at, the, look at the last part of verse 9. And fire came down from the heaven and devoured them. And look at verse 10. And the devil who, was, who deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the false prophets are and they'll be tormented day and night forever. So it looks like Satan's going to win, but he's going to lose. And we are going to win. Now the rest of the chapter there, verses 11 through 15, uh, talks about uh, the judgment uh, and, and talks about the second death. These, these things we can understand pretty good. But let's keep, suffice it to say that, uh, that uh, if we stay faithful to God, we're going to be on the winning side because Satan is going to lose. Now next week we'll, uh, we're, we're going to quickly scan over chapters 21 and 22. They're fairly easy to understand. Uh, a lot easier than some of these other ones, you know. And then the Wednesday night after that we'll have our uh, gospel meeting, uh, and then I'll be gone to Costa Rica after that, so I wanted to get through with, with Revelation by, by next Wednesday night, and you'll, I'll give you a handout next Wednesday night that kind of summarizes everything.
makes a lot of noise when you bump that just a little bit, doesn't it? Sorry about that. Good to see everybody. Welcome everybody here tonight and our visitors. Welcome you back anytime that you might be in our area. Well, let's see. Be a good time to silence your electronic devices if you haven't already done so. If it's like mine, it'll go off at the worst possible time, so you need to go ahead and do that. If anybody needs a nursery, there's one in the back to my left as you would go out those doors if, if you need that. The next time we will meet will be Sunday morning for our classes at 9.30, our worship service at 10.05, and then we'll meet again Sunday evening at 5.30. And of course, Wednesday night at 7. I don't have that many announcements tonight. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Devon Skinner was supposed to have had carpal tunnel surgery today. Have we heard anything at all? Sorry? You haven't? Maybe no news is good news on that because we haven't heard any, any different. We need to continue to remember those who have lost loved ones. Been several over the past week or two. We need to remember Pat and Thomas Lindsay who have lost Renee Lindsay Wallace and we need to remember that there will be a memorial fellowship here on March the 16th. We need to keep everyone on our prayer list in our mind and in our prayers. Charlie Rowe is sick tonight. Is he feeling any <clears throat> any better? Not really. You need to remember, remember Charlie. <coughs> A lot of others. Kyla Penny, Danny Rogers need to continue to remember those families. Lauren Snavely, Bill Rawls need to remember the King family and our prayers. Keep them in our in our thoughts and prayers. Has anyone heard anything else about the two young men that were injured in the accident the other night? Austin Walker and there was the, an update. It sounds like the Walker boy is improving, but I, I don't know about the other boy. Okay. Evan says that it sounds like the Walker boy is improving, but he doesn't know about the, the Hooks boy. Also need to remember that the Brooklyn Church of Christ will have a Ladies' Day on April 16th at 8.30, beginning at 8.30 in the morning. Breakfast will be provided. And of course, again, our prayer list. Continue to remember Ken and Naomi. They, they're still, Ken's undergoing treatments. We need to keep them in our minds as well. There will also be a gospel meeting here, March 10th through the 13th, Chase Almond of the Grace Point Church will be our speaker. So we need to keep that in our prayers and look forward to that. Is there anything else? Any other announcements? Evan? I went ahead and shot Dee a text. And she said that Devon, everything went well with his surgery. Okay. Evan says he just got a text that everything went well with Devon Skinner's surgery today. So that's good. If there isn't anything else, those that are participating in our services tonight, Wes will be leading our singing. Some guy named Dan Stokes will be our speaker. Our closing prayer will be Wade Taylor, and at this time Lance Liddell will lead us in our opening prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. Lord, we're thankful for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for those material blessings that we have. Uh, we're thankful for the means that you have uh, provided for us that we can provide for ourselves, the talents that we have, the health that we have, uh, the blessing of living where we do in such a blessed nation that we can provide for ourselves as well. More importantly, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that you have given us. We're thankful for your Lord, or thankful for your Son and our Savior, um, Jesus, and his, so his willingness to die upon the cross for us, uh, the sacrifice that he made for us, the suffering that he went through. Lord, we ask that you would help us to reflect on that daily, to keep it in our, the forefront of our minds uh, so that we can reflect on how much we should appreciate what we have and the blessings of a chance at a home within heaven. 
Lord, we ask that you would forgive us when we do and say those things that are contrary to your will, when we fail to act as we should, when we should, and we have a penitent heart. Lord, we're thankful for our church here. We're thankful for all of these people that you have put in our lives, the love and the encouragement that we receive. Lord, we ask that you would help us to take all of this and help us to take what we have received, to grow from that, and to be able to, in turn, be someone that, rather than it's um, always a receiver and a taker, to be a giver, to be there for other people, to be supportive. Lord, we ask that you would be with those that have been mentioned tonight, those that are sick, those that have lost loved ones. We ask that you would be with them, comfort them, and if it be your will, return them to a better measure of health. Lord, we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Number 800.
760. 760. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to talk with you a little bit this evening about the fact that sometimes we do what we are thinking to do for someone else, and it ends up benefiting us. In the Old Testament, one of the prophets by the name of Isaiah, we find in Isaiah 6 and 8, God needed someone to go tell the people. And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. We also find out from reading the book of Isaiah that God revealed to Isaiah more about Christ than anyone else wrote in the Old Testament. Isaiah, by going on a missionary trip in his own land, received more. He went to tell, but he also received. If you've never been on a missionary trip, I recommend that you do so. Because when you go on that missionary trip, you will understand the Bible a little bit better you will understand God's people all over the world a little better. And you may just benefit more from the mission trip than the people you go to do missionary work for. Now we have a meeting coming up. That's a mission field right here. We have people we can go see and invite. You have neighbors and people we could fill this building to overflowing if we will put forth some effort. And I have this strong feeling that we will receive as much or more from inviting people and being here ourselves than they will. I had the opportunity once to go to uh, a country in Europe. I flew into Paris France, saw the Eiffel Tower. It's kind of like seeing the Statue of Liberty. It's not as big as you thought. It's really not as impressive as you thought. And from there I went to a land that is in war right now. So this evening I will say to you, Des Bizanya, which means good day in Ukrainian. I went to the city of Kiev. From there I went to Donetsk. And from there I went to a place called Solidar. And while I was there, we did vacation Bible school. We met with the people. My interpreter was a man by the name of Ivan. He and I were drafted in 1972, he and the Russian army, and I into the American army, except Nixon stopped the draft, if you'll remember, in November of 1972. And we got sent home that were drafted. He didn't get sent home. He spent two years in the Russian army, but he was my interpreter while I was there. And Ivan helped me out to see and understand better. In our Bible, we read about Jesus telling us that we are the salt of the earth. He tells us in Mark, the ninth chapter, in the 50th verse, that we're to have salt in us and that we are to be at peace. You see, there was two salt covenants in the Old Testament, one with Aaron's family back in Numbers 18 and one with David's family, one on the priesthood and one on the kings. And it was a covenant of salt that you read about in 2 Chronicles with the family of David. It was to be everlasting. Do you know the offerings that were made in the Old Testament had to be made with salt? There was four rooms in Herod's temple. One had wood in it for the sacrifice. Two were places where you could meet, one to study and one to meditate. But the fourth room was full of salt. Good salt for the offerings and bad salt. 
because when it rained there, the marble tiles would get slick and they would put this salt out on it, not to de-ice, but to give it a gritty form so that people walked on it. I didn't know that. So when Jesus said, if the salt's good, have it in you. And if the salt isn't good, you know what it's good for, to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. You know what bad salt has in it? Earthly materials besides salt. Now salt in its purest form is fairly clear. While I was in Solidar, they took us to a mine. We had two choices. We could, uh, well, actually, we had a third one. We didn't have to go into the mine. But in this salt mine, you could travel for 27 miles on these little low-riding trains that went in and had cars that carried the salt out. Now, they traveled about 15 miles an hour, so you could take about two hours ride. Or you could, over near the end of it, go down a shaft. Now, some of you know what an old well is. And you know what an old bucket is that has the plunger in it. Well, in this shaft, it was just wide enough for two people. And when you got in over here, it was counter lever. You went down and another person that was down there went up. Now, it was 900 meters, a little over that, to the bottom of this shaft. Now, some of you are good at mathematics, and the rest of us, it was a little over a half a mile. Folks, I was in a little bitty thing going down and the light up there disappeared and I couldn't see the light down there for a little while. There was a spot in through there where it was dark. Kind of like when Jesus put in the part about you to be the light of the world. Folks, if you go down in a salt mine, it's a half a mile below ground and they turn the lights out, you can feel the dark. They did that to us just to let us know what it was like. But the thing about being down there, they let us become shock tars. Now, I know all of y'all are glad that I became a shock tar for a little while as soon as you figure out what that is. Well, that's the word for a minor. And the Denance soccer team is called shock tars, the miners. And they let us mine a piece of salt. We could get one piece of salt and bring home with us. <laughs> Now, most of you back there probably can't see my little piece of salt that I got. But some of you will be able to see it. That is a piece of pure salt. Folks, it is the good stuff. And it is fairly clear. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like on you, the lenses on your cars. If you lit, uh, take water and wash over this, it gets clear as can be because it takes the outer part off. Now that was as big a piece as I could stick in my pocket. I could have got a big one. But by going on this missionary trip, going down in a salt mine, those of you that have that Google stuff, you can look up Solidar Mines. S-O-L-A-D-A-R in the Ukraine. In 2012, 97% of the salt that went to Russia came out of these salt mines here around Solidar. And the leader of the Ukraine doubled the price of salt. They had a little war four years after I was there in 16, and then they put the salt back down. A little over two years ago, the new president of the Ukraine tripled the price of salt. Russia doesn't pay for salt from the Ukraine anymore. They control the mines. They took that area right along with the Crimean. Salt was valuable. We get the word salary from it. But that ain't what Jesus was talking about money. Jesus was talking about two things here in Matthew, the fifth chapter. First of all, he talked to us about be the salt of the earth. Good salt, 
pure salt. Do you know that meant friendship and peace? When you look at Mark, the ninth chapter, in the 50th verse, and if you would turn there with me, I'd like to read it. Maybe it will make more sense to you. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost his saltiness, wherewith will it be seasoned? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. All living things need salt. Not too much salt, but salt, especially on watermelons. But we, all living things have to have salt. What type of salt are you? Are you the salt of peace and the salt of preservation and preserving and long lasting and fellowship and peace? Or are you bad salt? Salt that is mixed with worldly things. Have you lost your saltiness? Or have you never been salty? You know, sometimes we think of calling somebody an old salt or salty is a bad thing. According to Jesus, it's a good thing. You're to have salt in you. Ladies and gentlemen, if we will do missionary work, you can do it right here in Green County. Or if you have the opportunity to go on a mission, say to yourself, when Jesus sent out the disciples on the Great Commission, go into all the world. When Isaiah said, here am I, send me, I hope you're of that thought because you will benefit much more than anyone else will. But to let your light shine, that we find in Matthew 5. You got to be pure inside first. You can't let your light shine if it's dark. You've got to be of good salt. If we can help you in any way this evening, would you please come as we stand and sing? Who followed Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight? Listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. together. Gracious Father in heaven, we come to you tonight as we close out this service and we thank you, Father, that uh, we were blessed to be here together tonight and take a reprieve from the rest of the world and the busyness of the week and uh, be together and have fellowship and study your word and hear your message. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, we ask that uh, you continue to bless us and that you uh, stay in our mind and our heart, that you help us to remember to pray for our family here, our loved ones, our friends. Father, we also ask that you uh, help us to pray for our enemies. Father, we, uh, we know we fall short in so many ways. And 
We need your strength every day, Father, to lead us from the temptations of this world. Father, we are so sorry that we are sinful and we cause the need for Jesus to make the sacrifice that he did on the cross. Please forgive us as we come repenting to you. It is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.